wife, you take the word of God, please, and let's begin in the book of Hebrews. If you'll turn there with me, please, to the book of Hebrews. We're in the 11th chapter and the 13th verse, Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 13. Remember, this is the word of God. And we're so grateful for God's word and how God uses his word to speak to us. And I pray God will use it in this meeting to speak to you. Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 13. The Bible says, these all died in faith, not having received the promise, but having seen them afar off and were persuaded of them and embraced them and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. I want you, if you would please, if you're in the habit of marking things in your Bible, to mark the expression pilgrims on earth. Pilgrims on earth. If you turn with me please to the book of 1 Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter chapter 2. The word of God says in verse 11, Dear beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lust, which war against the soul. If you mark again in your Bibles in the 11th verse of chapter 2 of 1 Peter, pilgrims. I want to speak to you for a moment on the pilgrim life of the Christian. The pilgrim life of the Christian. You recognize if you're a Christian, you recognize that you're a pilgrim, just a pilgrim. The two words God puts together here, one is strangers, which means not belonging to me. Not belonging to me. That's not mine. It's not your world. It doesn't belong to you. You're a stranger here. If you were somewhere in another part of the world from your home country or home area or homeland and someone saw you or pointed you out, you would know that you're a stranger there. That's not your home place. You're a stranger there. And God speaks of all of us who his children saying that we're strangers here. This does not belong to us. Not ours. The word of God uses a word like this in the Old Testament to describe a woman who's not your wife. And if you started to show any kind of affection or attention to her, she's to be strange to you. Not just strange looking, but strange. She does not belong to you. She's not yours. You have no business with her. And then he combines with that the word pilgrim. Pilgrim has to do with journeying just going through, no permanent dwelling. We're just pilgrims here. May I say to you, if I'm not mistaken, the greatest tragedy in the Christian life is for those of us who are Christians not to have realized that we are truly pilgrims here. We're just passing through. That's all there is to it. We're just passing through. Hold your place here. We'll come back in a moment. I want you to turn to the very first book in the Bible, the book of Genesis if you have your Bible up to the 47th chapter. Jacob comes to Egypt. There's a mighty thing going on there through Joseph. And Jacob has a meeting with the Pharaoh of Egypt. And he gives his testimony, he speaks his heart uh, to the Pharaoh in Genesis chapter 47 and verse 9. And the Bible says, And Jacob said unto Pharaoh, The days of the years of my pilgrimage are an hundred and thirty years. Few and evil have the days of the years of my life been, and have not obtained unto the days of the years of the life of my fathers in the days of their pilgrimage. And we know the great patriarchs of the Bible. We understand Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and we're hearing one of these men speak here and he stands before the mighty Pharaoh. And he's really giving a testimony when he uses this language. He says, here is how long my pilgrimage has been thus far. And my pilgrimage has not been as long as my father's pilgrimage. He talks about the pilgrimage of Abraham and Isaac but my pilgrimage, my journey, this is just a journey here. God 
intends for us to learn so many things about our lives from this one word. Think of it. From this one word. If you turn to the Psalms just for a moment, the Psalms and the longest Psalm, Psalm 119, God says here in verse 19, I am a stranger in the earth. Hide not thy commandments from me. May I read it like this? Just sort of giving a commentary on it as I read it. I am a stranger in the earth, so I need to hear from you. Hide not thy commandments from me. Lord, I'm here alone except for you. Speak to me, guide me. Show me thy way. I'm not going to be able to learn my way from the world. Show me thy way. God uses this amazing word, pilgrim, to teach us that we are not to put such deep roots into this world. That's an easy thing to say, but a very difficult thing to do. You and I can become so attached to something, any, any number of things, but so attached to something in this world that it takes our attention from Christ and from our Christian pilgrimage. It dominates our thinking. It causes us to change our goals and objectives. We, we want things we don't necessarily need, but we become so much like the world We've forgotten that we're here on a pilgrimage. We're just passing through. I was thinking just a moment ago, my Ken was singing. That's the first time I've heard him sing a solo. He'd been here a long time. And somebody says, why hasn't he sung before? Well, I'll tell you, he wasn't asked. But God also knew that I didn't need him like I need him until this moment. You think about that. I didn't need him like I need him to this moment. Well, I must have had eight or 10 ideas while he was singing, different thoughts about different songs I want him to sing. You see, God has built life in stages. I remember when I was a child, but I'm not a child anymore. You remember when you were a child? I love children, I love childhood. I think every man should become a man without ceasing some of his childish ways. We wondered, we were amazed. A man told me one time, I remember in Selma, Alabama, he had a monkey in his gasoline station. I mean, a live monkey. And uh, I wanted that monkey. I was infatuated with that monkey. I went crazy about that monkey. I still remember it. I still remember the man teasing me about his monkey. And he said, if you'll go home and get a quarter, I'll sell you this monkey. I was a child. I believed him. I like to kill myself getting home, crossing streets, finding a quarter, begging somebody out of it. And I didn't walk. I ran as fast as I could run back to the filling station because I thought surely somebody would have already bought my monkey. And when I went in, I held up that quarter like it was the nicest thing in all the world. And I said, I brought the quarter. Now, I want the monkey. And he said, son, I'm just kidding you. I'm just kidding you. I say to you, that man didn't understand boys. He might have understood monkeys, but he didn't understand boys. I believed him. That was a stage in my life, a stage of wonder and excitement, belief, a stage when God put things into my heart and mind, through, especially through my great aunts, Aunt Maddie and Aunt Fanny, Never will I forget them. Never will I forget them. When I happen to be in that part of the country after all these years and I go to their graves, I think of what they imparted into me at a certain time in my life. I remember when I was a teenager and uh, I loved being a teenager, a young teenager. I remember so many things about it. I was excited about it. But I'm no longer a teenager I remember when I got married, Evelyn and I, we were excited. It was a wonderful time, wonderful time. But I'm no longer a young married man. 
I remember when God dealt with me about preaching his word and you can just imagine all the memories and exciting things are in my heart and mind thinking about the stages of the ministry God has given me. They weren't all the same. They were never exactly the same, but stages. I had a wonderful stage in ministry pastoring the Greenback Memorial Baptist Church in Greenback, Tennessee. When I went there, we had about 30 people. That's back when we counted every head, you know, counted everything. That was the first church I was ever in and the only church that ever said to me, we never go in debt but $5,000 at one time. I thought, how am I going to lead this church? I learned a lot of things. I learned things about country people and good people, earnest people. And I remember the blessings of God there. I can remember sermons that I preached and people said amazing things to me. They were blessed and helped. I was just a kid preacher and I remember those things, but I'm no longer the youngest preacher in a preacher's fellowship or the young preacher of the first church I pastored. I remember the ministry in Calvary Baptist Church in Lenore City. I was getting a little older. And then I went on from there to the Highland Park Baptist Church. Dr. Robertson, if I if I'd loved him anymore, I, I would have idolized him. I admired him. I wanted to see him. I wanted to be around him. I wanted to listen to him. I took to heart everything he said and he loved me the same way. He said to me, you're like a son to me. I'll remember that as long as I live. But I'm no longer the late 20s and early 30 young preacher and associate there. Then I went to Patterson, New Jersey and I was the youngest pastor they ever had. They'd been without a pastor for five years. They kept fish in the baptistry because they had a custodian who fished and caught fish and had no place to put them. So when I went there, they said, well, we haven't baptized anybody in all these years. We thought it ought to be used for something. And so fish were swimming around in it. That's interesting. They took me to the parsonage where the pastor was to live, my wife and I, and there were rabbits living in it. And there was about a foot of water in the basement. And the candidate committee chairman who took me there said, you don't want to come here. Look at this mess. And he drove me through the worst part of town in Patterson, New Jersey. He said, nobody in their right mind wants to bring their family to a place like this. Now, this is the pulpit committee chairman. Nice guy, yeah, really nice guy. But he didn't want me there. And every time he said something like that, it just emboldened me to want to be right there and see what God wanted to do. We were just a few miles from New York City, and boy, I was fired up. I was fired up. First house I knocked on in Patterson, New Jersey, I went to the door, knocked on the door, and they opened the door, and there was a, a dead goat in the doorway. I'm talking about one that had been gutted, lying there dead. They said, we're fixing to drag him out in the backyard and cook him. Don't step on him. So I stepped over him. They were having a wedding reception. And something they'd done historically, traditionally with their family. And I thought, well, I really am in a strange place. Strange place. If you knock on 10 doors, nine of them couldn't speak English as a first language. And I thought, this is amazing. This is challenging. Everybody said it can't be done. This is a preacher's graveyard. We've been trying to find a pastor for five years and nobody even come and give us a trial sermon. We've written the Philadelphia College of the Bible and that's the most famous place we know anything about for years. They wouldn't even send a person up here to preach. But I was just chomping at the bits. I wanted to do anything and everything. That was a stage in my life. Now I still, I'm still fired up. I came here and I wasn't 40 years old. A different stage in my life. I was maturing some. In New Jersey, I had to learn to preach not about the Bible, but the Bible. They just said, we don't want to hear about the Bible. We want to hear the Bible. They gave me some of Pastor Drew's books. I met a woman that had heard Pastor Drew while he was still alive. They gave me some of Pastor Drew's books and said, now this is what we want you to do. We want you to teach and preach the Bible to us. Well, no one had ever said that to me. I thought I was doing that. But that was a time in my life where I needed that. I'm saying to you, 
I'm now in a stage in my life. I think about things I've never thought before. I think about things I need to do that I've never thought about doing before. What is going on with me? The same thing that's going on with you. We are on a pilgrimage. And every stage of the pilgrimage brings things to complete us and make us more like the Lord if we'll allow that to happen. Well, I said to the woman in New Jersey who was the Sunday school superintendent, she didn't stay that way long because she didn't want to do anything we asked her to do and she's a nice woman. She loved us, we loved her, but we just couldn't work together. She said to me one day, I, no man's ever told me what to do. I'm an independent woman. I do what I want to do. And uh, I said to her, do you realize what kind of changes I've had to go through just to be here in this strange place as the pastor? She got right in my face and she said, do you realize how many things we've had to change because you're our pastor? You know what it was? It was good for me. It helped me. It helped me get off my high horse and recognize there's two sides to things. It humbled me. It enlarged my thinking. I am so glad God has met me all through this pilgrimage and he's still meeting me. That's why I'm excited because I know there's more to come, but it's still just a pilgrimage, just a pilgrimage. I used to want things I don't want now. I have anything you could imagine. People are good to me. My wife loves me. My children are good to me. My daughter-in-law's good. My grandchildren I adore, they act like they adore me and I thank God for them. And think about that part of my pilgrimage. I didn't start out this pilgrimage with these loving grandsons and granddaughters or these daughters-in-law. God is with us. He wants us to recognize, but it's still just a pilgrimage. Don't put your roots down so far. Don't do it. Don't get wrapped up in something. I used to love football, man, alive. I lived across from the high school football field. I was there every day they practiced when I was just a kid. I loved it. I loved it so much I played. I don't guess I was as good as some, but I was captain of the team and all that kind of thing because I just, I loved it. I was eaten up with it. But you know, Jesus worked in my life in such a way that I lost most of that interest. I didn't want to talk about it anymore. And you know, God speaks to you about things. He speaks to you during your pilgrimage about things you adore that you shouldn't adore. God begins to speak to you. It is a pilgrimage. Why, we want to do things in this church. I think good things, but not the best things. And God has worked on my heart with those things. If I look back now about this pilgrimage I've had in this ministry nearly 30 years, I think here, What's important? What's important? I told one of my sons today about little Miss Clavo and a little girl we reached as a child in Patterson. They finally graduated from Yale University, got a brain cancer right after graduation, went to be the Lord and told me what peace she had when I talked to her when she's dying in the hospital. Her brother just texted my wife and he was just a little old bitty boy, Alex Clavejo, and now he's president of a bank in Patterson, New Jersey. If you ask me about big days, oh, we had them. We had so many things going on, like you could imagine. We became the largest landowner in Patterson, New Jersey. Think about that. Third most densely populated city in America. Oh, we were so happy about that. Matter of fact, they've sold millions of dollars that I've purchased and the church went along with all that when I was a pastor there. But I'm happy about, happier about those children and things like that than I am any of that stuff. I wouldn't have said that even when I was doing that. But I've learned that at this juncture in that pilgrimage. Are you learning anything? Are you learning that heaven and earth will pass away? That everything you've got your eyes on will burn up? You appreciate your house, your home, your cars, your job, your clothing? You appreciate it all? Be thankful, be grateful. 
but don't live for it. We're just on a pilgrimage. See, the devil and the world and the flesh is after every Christian to knock them off this pilgrimage. Now we know the world system will do it. We know the devil surely will do all he can to get us to forget about our pilgrimage. And the flesh, the, the old nature we've got is like a magnet inside of it and it draws us like a magnet to every kind of world in us. And we have to fight the good fight of faith to allow that not to happen. God help us. And that fight goes on all of your life, the whole pilgrimage, all of your life. Let's look here just at a little thing or two God says in these verses. Hebrews chapter 11, speaking of these people we read about in this hall of faith, these all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off and were persuaded of them and embraced them and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on this earth. God says of these great ones we read about in this hall of faith, that they learned the lesson that they were just strangers here. So they lived in tents, dwellings that lasted just a few days. They moved from place to place. They trusted God for water and food. They learned they were strangers on this earth and just pilgrims. Look at the verse Peter writes under the inspiration of the Spirit of God in chapter two, First Peter one. Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims. That's where we're starting now. Let's get on this same level ground. Strangers and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts, which war against the soul. That's a strong word. We're doing battle every day on this pilgrimage. Would you write these things down quickly? This pilgrimage is a pilgrimage of faith. Faith. So do everything you can to strengthen your faith because it'll always be a pilgrimage of faith. You have to remind yourself where we're headed. You have to remind yourself what's true about God and God's word. Anything that will strengthen your faith, run to it. Let it saturate your life. Run from things that'll hinder your faith. The word of God says these people in the book of Hebrews, they lived by faith. They never had what we have even, but they had faith. Peter says we're in a war on this pilgrimage. Some of you have not only read Pilgrim's Progress, John Bunyan's famous book, but you've absorbed it and been absorbed by it. I've thought often that we ought to take it on as a church for everybody just to read it and point out the lessons from it. But our pilgrimage is something we are on. You can't change it, it's nothing less than that or more than that, it's only a pilgrimage. I was doing a little research trying to find who was the oldest person that we know in recent times to live to what age. And I found the name of a woman named Jeannie Calumet in France. Now I found other people but you couldn't substantiate their age. But well, this woman's age you could have substantiate. She lived to be a, nearly 120, oh, 122 years old, nearly 123 years old. One of the cute things about her life is someone was trying to invest for her and help her and talk to her into one of these reverse mortgages. She didn't die until 1997. And so the man was 47 years old who said to her, I'd like to help you with a reverse mortgage. We'll pay you so much every month until you die. Well, he died at 70-something. That's how old she was when he offered it to her. She didn't die <laughs> until 122. The man's family and grandchildren had to pay her what they promised and contracted to give her in her reverse, reverse mortgage. But she still died. She died. I read one man I read in the Caribbean who says 131 years old. It couldn't be substantiated, had no birth certificate, but he was 131 years old, so he said. He was 120-something when he married a 45-year-old woman. 
Must have been a hopeful guy. But anyway, you couldn't substantiate that he was that old when he died. But he died. And you and I are on a pilgrimage. And our destination is heaven. We must never forget that. And everything we have, we're leaving behind. Everything. We came in with nothing, we're going out with nothing. And I know we've been attacked by things in our own flesh, you know, a war. We've warred to have the nicest place to live or the nicest clothes to wear or the nicest job or the nicest things to hand to our grandchildren. But sometimes we've left a bad example. We've said to them, live for this world, live for this world, live for this world, when in reality, we're just on a pilgrimage in this world, just passing through. It's a pilgrimage of faith. It's a pilgrimage of fellowship. Would you write that word down? Fellowship with Christ. With Christ. How big is Christ in your life? How big is he in my life? One of the great challenges I face every day is the challenge between who and what. What I do and who I do it for. Is it for the Lord? Is it because of the Lord? Do I start with the Lord? Do I want to glorify the Lord? And it, it doesn't get any easier. But I must fellowship with the Lord. The one thing I don't have time for is God. And don't look so strange at me. You're the same person. Fellowship. And you know there's fellowship with God's word. There's fellowship with God's people in the church meetings. You know, one of the things I look forward to, I'm going to see you and talk with you and fellowship with you. That's why you ought to be careful as you can about what you talk to me about and I ought to be careful as I can about what do you talk to you about. We're fellowship and we're rejoicing in the Lord. We're pilgrims on this thing together. We're pilgrims. So let's talk about things about our pilgrimage. That means that eliminates a lot of this junky talk. I don't enjoy coming to church and somebody saying, you hear about the University of Tennessee? They, back, they got, they got, they. I don't care what the University of Tennessee did. I don't care. Now, if we've got somebody pay, playing there that's one of our folks and we love them and pray for them and they're one of our fellow Christians, that's different. But so many subjects brought up in the place of worship are not subjects that help us in our walk with God on this pilgrimage. And we ought to be more careful about that, more prayerful about it. We come together, we come together to worship the Lord, to honor the Lord. It's a pilgrimage of fellowship. And these things that bring us closer to God and God's people are so vital in our lives. One by one, members of our pilgrimage, one by one, they go to glory. And the reason we can handle it is because we know they've gone from faith to sight. They're with the Lord and we can handle, we can deal with it. And I'm going to deal with it with you or you're going to deal with it with me if the Lord doesn't come soon. Illnesses, sicknesses, terminal illnesses and diseases Let's get to seeing this thing like we ought to see it. This is a pilgrim journey, a journey of fellowship. And then some people won't like this. It's a journey of separation. I wonder what you think separation is. I wonder what you think separation is. It's separation to the Lord and from the world. Let's read the verse again. In verse 11, 1 Peter chapter 2. Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims, because you're strangers and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lust, which war against the soul. Separation to the Lord. And the world becomes less important and less valuable to us as Christ becomes more important and more valuable to us. The word of God says, again, in the book of Hebrews, in this verse, it deals with the, the pilgrimage and strangers. Chapter 11, verse 13. These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off and were persuaded of them 
and embraced them and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. I want you to notice, please, they were persuaded. There's a battle there. Decisions made there. No, I'm not going that way. I'm not doing that. I'm not engaging in that. I'm not allowing that. I'm persuaded of other things. And I embrace them because I'm a pilgrim. I'm just a pilgrim here. Listen to this powerful verse. Paul wrote the church in Corinth and the Bible says in chapter 6 of 2 Corinthians verse 17, write the reference down. Wherefore come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing and I'll receive you. This pilgrim journey is a pilgrim journey of separation to God. Separation to God. And until finally, all we have left is God. I've read so many things that clinical people and professional people and medical people have written about death. And for those who are believers, there's a separation that happens in death that's so marked, they all write about it. There comes a time when the person dying no longer speaks. They don't want to talk. They don't want a conversation in this world. Some of you in nursing, you don't know what I'm talking about. They no longer want anything to eat and people stand over the top of them. You've got to eat something, you're going to live. You've got to eat, you've got to. They don't want any food from this world. They're done with it. It's over now. Their heart and mind is closed on this world. It's closed. They're nearing home. Their pilgrimage is ending. They're going to see Jesus face to face. They don't need that anymore. And this half century of ministry, I've seen it so many times, so many times. How do you imagine I'm thinking when I see young people and old people and all people want to get more like the world and more like the world? And they want to bring more of the world in God's work. What do you think I'm thinking when I see that? When the world wants you. Less and less of the things of God, more and more of the world. What do you think I'm thinking about that tug on people? Oh, oh, if I had the time, I could get on the fashion of this world, the clothing of this world. You say, this is what everybody's doing. Not everybody on a Christian pilgrimage is doing it. Not everybody on a Christian pilgrimage is wearing it. The reason they want to look that way is because there's so much of the world in them. They're so identified with the world. But if Jesus Christ meant to them what he ought to mean to them, everything out there would change. But they've lost sight of the pilgrimage. And they've lost sight of the fact that this is a pilgrimage of separation. I used to say something to people when I was just a young preacher. I haven't said it in years, but I should say it again and again. I said, the rule for the Christian life is, anytime you know what God wants, just say yes. If you don't know what God wants, say yes, I want to know. Just keep saying yes, keep saying yes, and keep saying yes. When you know the mind of God about a thing, agree with God. Agree with God. I wrote an article for our faithful men's meeting just the other day, and I said, faithful men agree with God. You know what that means? It means you separate from the world because you've agreed with God. You embrace what the Lord wants because on your pilgrimage, you know, this world is not your home. I've made some serious mistakes. I've placed too much emphasis on what the world places emphasis on. I've made some serious mistakes with things. Oh, I want to be comfortable like you do, but how much of that do we need? I want to be safe just like you do. But what do we have to bind around us? The life-changing thing for the Christian is to live the pilgrim journey. And here we've come. Yes, here we've come. 
I don't know how it happened. I just don't know how it happened. But here we've come to the end of another year. And it's as though on this pilgrim journey, God gives us markers, like age markers and health markers. He gives us markers and times when we can say, look, there's some real adjustments that need to be made in my life if I'm going to live the pilgrim life. And Lord, I can't make them without you helping me. Can't make them. It's like people who quit a bad habit. They said, I've tried a hundred times. But then somebody says, I just ask God moment by moment, day by day, hour by hour to help me get a victory in this. And he did. And he did. You know, people save a lot of money just trusting the Lord for the victory. And you and I have to seek God every day for the victory in this pilgrim journey. I don't think I was a wise person and I don't know why I had the faith at this time to say this, but I said to Evelyn when we began to love one another and I wanted to marry, I said, now look, I don't even know what I'm going to do with my life. I don't have any idea. I think I'm going to be a coach. This is before God directed me to be a preacher and a pastor. But I said, I don't want to go any further here with you in this romance unless we settle this. There's one thing in my life I want. I want a Christian home. I said, do you understand that? You grew up in one. I didn't grow up in one. I want a Christian home. And that's going to take a lot of work and we're going to have to agree on it. A Christian home. Never had one. I grew up around cursing and alcohol and all this kind of stuff. A Christian home. God was working in my heart. And I knew that I had to live a pilgrim life. That's why Mrs. Miller, my English teacher, said, something has happened to you. That's why Mrs. Mrs. Biology teacher, Mrs. Bolton said, Clarence, something is going on in you. That's when Mr. Davis put his arm around me and said, you know, I've always cared a lot about you, son, but God has something special for you. Something's happened in you. You see, I couldn't explain it to them, but the Lord was teaching me things about this pilgrim life. That was just... 17, 18 years old. But I'm going to tell you something. That began to separate me from things I once made so great as the Lord became greater and greater. That's the secret. That's the secret. I'm not against you and you're not against me. But we all ought to be wholeheartedly for Jesus Christ and when we deal with anything that even looks like it's going to be a battle with the faith life and fellowship with God and the separated life, we say, no, no, I choose the Lord. I want the Lord in this. I never gave one thought to being as old as I am now. Never. I just got here. How many of you feel the same way? You didn't think about it. You just got here. But you know what we did? We made choices. And we become the result of our choices. Some were not very good. Not as good as they could be. But one choice, one fork in the road after another, going the right way, going the right way. Maybe going the wrong way and have to get it, repent of it and come back. But it's our choices. And someday all of us We'll look in the mirror and say, I never thought I, I wonder who I am when I look in the mirror. But it's happened. I'm not near the end, I don't think. I'm pressing on. 
I'm like the boxer who said, how you want to be remembered? He said, as the oldest man that ever lived. So I got a lot in my heart to do. But I could live much longer and make a mess if I get off this pilgrim life. Well, I've said enough. I do love you and I want God's best for you. Pastors are really prompters. They can't make you do anything. And if they start trying, it's rude and abrasive and trying to be against someone's conscience. But they can take the spirit of Jesus Christ and prompt you to think about this. So you make the choice. And the choice is living the pilgrim life. We are passing through. Right? That's for all of us. Let's pray, may we?